Kia ora tata. My name is Sean Burgess. I'm the Program Manager for Diabetes at the Ministry. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Uli Schmiedel, and his presentation, Type 2 Diabetes, Overcoming Clinical Inertia. Uli is a uh, consultant in endocrinology, diabetes, and general internal medicine at Auckland. He's also the clinical director of the Auckland Diabetes Centre. Uli qualified in medicine from Humboldt University in Berlin and completed his postgrad education in diabetes and endocrinology at Cardiff University in Wales. Uli has been a specialist here in Aotearoa since 2009, initially in Hawke's Bay, where he played a key role in the transformation of secondary diabetes services, creating greater cooperation between the different service providers. His clinical and research interests include the management of diabetes, obesity, and obesity-related complications. Welcome, Dr. Uli Schmiedel. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for having me here. Um, and I wanted to give you a clinical perspective. That's really my background, and that's probably what I can contribute here. So some of the uh, documents that I show you today are really a collaborative work and some of the stuff is also written up in this article as you can see here from research review. Now before we really start I thought it would be important to actually understand what is inertia. Why actually do we talk about it as clinical inertia, as inertia generally? And then really what contributes to it and show you some practical solutions, some things that we have done in the last few years in Auckland as a larger team, and really come up with some solutions, some possible outcomes, some ideas. And I'm very nice or very pleased to hear that there's far more than we can do on the ground that actually the ministry is putting real money in to support these initiatives. So, yep. If you talk about inertia, so the other question is, what motivates people actually? And that really comes to the heart of when we design services. So things that we believe are true and that we value, that make a difference to us and that are close to us. And we need supportive circumstances, otherwise we cannot achieve these things. And we need to see some progress. Without progress, things become very stale. So maybe we start off with a case story because I told you it's really from the clinician's angle. So this person is really an example of many patients we see in the diabetes center on a regular basis. So a 46-year-old female diagnosed 17 years ago, initial diabetes in pregnancy, and then uh, treated with insulin really in the last few years. But between a lot of things happened, so she developed nephropathy, declining renal function, all the complications that you get with diabetes, really exacerbated by intermittent control, hypertension, neuropathy, and retinopathy, as well as, of course, her obesity, which is clearly contributing to all these factors. Uh, diabetic vascular disease leading to food ulcers, and of course, missed appointments. So she was uh, discharged, as we always do, in secondary care after recurrent do not shows. And then she was picked up, interesting enough, by one of our nurses in a community clinic, where she saw the, the patient together with a practice nurse and brought the patient really back into the fold. And it transpired that there was a lot of background history of social problems, trauma, and of course low pay. And that really led to many years of poor control. So the question was, what do we do for her and for the many other people who are in a similar situation? And so why does it matter? I want to give you a few slides about some of the problems you really just heard from the minister. So diabetes is common and it's increasing. And it has a significant impact on society 
And as you can see, 40% of diabetes have poor control. 40%, that's a number to swallow. And it's, of course, expensive. So the cost is going up. That's just an estimated cost of 600 million. Goes back a number of years, 2006, 2007. So the anticipated cost goes to 1.7 billion. And that is, I think, the direct diabetes-related cost, not all the other associated costs. So, and a particular area of interest for us and for me is actually type 2 diabetes in the young people. As you can read there, that the mortality and morbidity of having diabetes, type 2 diabetes, in early age is actually worse than having type 1 diabetes at any age or as developing type 2 diabetes later on. So it's actually a slightly different disease, young onset type 2 diabetes. And these people develop renal failure and a lot of other complications related to diabetes much earlier on and have a often a far more aggressive progression of their disease. And on the other side, of course, these are the people living in poorer death cells. These are the people who don't take their medication, the people that don't come to the appointments and who we often pick up far too late. And then just a few stats from my presentation from my colleagues from Vitamin Tau. So you see on your uh, right side there, really the age groups, and you see the, the three different bars, 2005, 11, and 17, and you see the increase. But on the right side, you see the split really between European, Maori, and Pacifica. And you can see, of course, Pacifica, the relationship to obesity. And that's a graph that's a slightly different cutoff because we talked before about an H1C of 64. Here's an H1C cutoff of 75. But you see again in the red and the blue lines, so the Maori and Pacifica have much poorer glycemic control. And the young people are the ones who, who have the poorest control. So, and that's about diabetes. Of course, underlying diabetes, you have obesity and you have pre-diabetes. So pre-diabetes, the figures are far more stark. So 40% of Auckland residents in Maori, Pacific, and Indo-Asians are diagnosed with either diabetes or pre-diabetes. And that is an H1C between 42 and 50. And nearly 26% of the general population have pre-diabetes. So, and if you look at this well-known graph, you see that New Zealand is pretty much on the bottom there, second from the bottom, and that are our obesity figures. And these are data from the health survey. So we have around 12.3% of children being obese, not just overweight, but obese. And these are, of course, uh, intergenerational problems. And we have around 32% which is an increase from 29% uh, of all people obese. So, of course, as you will see, there's a big difference between the different ethnicities. But even in the Caucasian population in New Zealand, we have more obesity than we have, for example, in a similar population in the UK. So the, the graph is a little bit old on the right side, but it just shows you really the increase over the years. And as you see in red there, that is, uh, again, very strongly connected with ethnicity and deprivation. And why does it matter? Because if you're obese, you die earlier. You die from cardiovascular disease, but you also die from lots of other conditions, including cancer. And that's just one slide from my obesity presentation. As you can see, lots of diseases are connected with obesity. And cancers like breast, bowel, uterine, these are common cancers we see with obesity. So, but on the other side, we can do something and we need to do something. So the question is, what are we doing? Really, so we know good outcome, i.e. good treatment, will improve microvascular and macrovascular complication. And this has a legacy effect, as you've shown there from the Diabetes uh, UK study, so really long-term effect of good control. So what it is about to overcome inertia is early diagnosis, timely commencement of treatment, 
and intensification of treatment. And to do this one, the message that Villa bring uh, over here many times, the home, the medical home of patients with type 2 diabetes is in primary care. And I think it is in lots of practices already throughout the country. But I will tell you a few little things, what is actually necessary to uh, have good diabetes management in primary care. And of course, it needs involved a lot of other markers, not only glycemic control, it's a complex disease, so we're looking for other things as well, microbenuria, blood pressure, lipids. So what we have in Auckland, and we agreed on this one a little while ago, two or three years ago, from over 20 indicators, we came down to five indicators. And these are measurable indicators, which I think it's very important to have something measurable. So it's really glycemic control, blood pressure control, management of microbenuria, and then primary and secondary cardiovascular prevention, i.e. how many patients who are the head or at risk of a cardiac event are on the appropriate treatment. And these are the set statistics. So I covered up where they come from, but they're all from the Auckland area, and they're all really between 2017 and 2019. So if you let it sit with you a little bit, so the percentage of patients with an H1C less than 64 millimoles per mole is decreasing despite all our best efforts. And on microbenuria, we have done over the years Nothing, despite our best efforts. So it is not an easy situation. And I wanted to mention here, I was reading yesterday evening something from the BBC where they talked about life expectancy in the UK for the poorest segment of the population is falling. So we are not alone here. So other countries have similar problems and it isn't easy to tackle. So it's a really a multi-pronged approach with uh, a lot of effort to achieve small, sustainable, positive change. So yes, if to do it right, uh, we basically should escalate treatment regularly, not only start it early, but also escalate it regularly. And I want to show you a few more slides. The minister already alluded to the problems with Maori. Really, Maori in Pacific, People have diabetes often 10 years earlier, and we talked about young onset type two. They have four to six times more amputations. They have the highest incidence of retinopathy, and of course, they have also the highest rates of DNA rates. We measure our DNA rates in our secondary care services, and they are at least 40, 50% higher for Maori than for other ethnicities. And that's really a slide taken from the um, paper to show you if you actually do something, you improve outcomes. So just to guide you through this graph, so the orange line is really patients who haven't been treated or intensified their treatment, and the dark line is the one who have intensified their treatment, and the gray area is really the legacy effect, i.e. the impact this has on other conditions, such as myocardial infection, stroke, heart failure, and composite cardiovascular outcome. So actually, treating, initiating early, even at this relatively low H1C makes a significant difference on the major outcomes. So I just want to have a little change of tack and say, so that's the problem. So what are we doing about it? And to go back, I thought, give you a few more words about what inertia actually means in a clinical context, and then show you some example how to actually progress. So it's about intensification of treatment or the lack thereof. And it really leads to a reduction, or if you do not do anything, it leads to increased preventable events, disability, deaths, and excess cost. And a good way to see it is actually as a medical error of omission. 
So we always talk about a medical error of prescribing the wrong thing or initiating or administering the wrong thing, but actually not doing something is also a medical error. And we know in other areas of medicine, so not treating someone with the appropriate treatment, not giving the treatment that would be right, is actually an error. And that leads to serious adverse outcomes. And for type two, it's of course failure to start the treatment at the appropriate time, and that is usually a diagnosis. And then treatment escalation, so if you have started treatment, you need to escalate it, and that's on the right and appropriate time to so the regular reviews. And so why does it happen? So what are the barriers? And I put them down really in two areas. So culture-specific, and we know this different health systems have different kinds of provisions, what is available, what is funded. But then, of course, culture-specific is also very important. Different cultures have a different way of doing the management, and we all seen this in clinics. So different ethnicities need a different way of approach. And maybe a little word from our experience. Uh, what I felt when I lead the Diabetes Center in Auckland, our team should really reflect in their ethnicities the people that sit in our waiting area. And that is a way how we can provide the best service for a multi-ethnic group in Auckland. So, and I will talk a little bit more about uh, the different categories, so about inertia, patient and their funnel, the clinicians and healthcare providers, and the systems. So I don't want to bore you too long with this. It's just a little background reading. It's about the health belief model. So why did I bring it in? Because it is important to understand your patients and to uh, have the appropriate empathy and understanding. And the underlying literature really is the uh, health belief model that uh, we weigh up what is correct for us against what other people tell us. So we weigh up our beliefs against the treatment. And that is based on our experience, our personal and our cultural experience, often our family and our past history. And it's important that we actually accept what patients tell us. So the patient is always right. That's what I tell all my junior staff. So you don't question the patient. The patient's right. And once you start with this one, you can actually tailor your treatment. So, and uh, that will also uh, narrow the gulf between the healthcare provider and allows us really to home in and to weigh up what is appropriate for the individual patient. And so if you talk about insulin in initiation, people who've been dealing with diabetes, we talk really about the psychological resistance to insulin. We all uh, been probably come across this one a lot of patients are afraid of insulin because of a number of reasons, really fear of injections, restriction to lifestyle, their past experiences, that they feel once they are on insulin they have failed. Of course, they are worried about weight gain and hypoglycemia, or they consider insulin starts as really the end of disease. And that often relates to what they were told early on. And so for the doctors, there are a number of reasons why doctors do not intensify treatment. Well, it's the time that they have for doing this because it's not easy to do. And then, of course, the fear to alienate their patients, to get resistance. And I see it often in clinics that patients come and say, please don't start me on insulin now. And then, of course, hypoglycemia and how to deal with it. Multiple comorbidities, especially the patients that have advanced disease, where hypoglycemia and complications are more likely. And then, of course, having appropriate funding, incentive, and structures around to do it practically. And then, of course, um, New Zealand-specific characteristics. As we already said, we have a very heterogeneous population. There are limited resources. I recently read the survey from the Royal College that we have roughly one third less physicians per population than in Australia. So we are stretched, as everyone knows. And of course, our environment, our social determinants of health, and our obesogenic environments. So, and really, the other thing is the model of care in primary care, which really grew out of the history 
of an acute care model, but with a growing need for dealing with chronic diseases, of course, there's a little change in the pr model of primary care. What I feel needs to be discussed, how there should be segments of primary care that focus on chronic disease management. So that's something I don't want you to go through now. It's all in the article. That's something you can see on the slides. But I'll just give you a little summary of all the things that uh, relate to patients, providers, and healthcare systems. Right, so how to overcome inertia. So you, as we already mentioned, it's about a person-centered person approach. And it needs to be multifaceted. So it can't be one solves all. So you have to segment it and you have to do small steps. And really, there's a lot of documentation from the ministry about how to do it, how to do shared decision making, care planning, and how you involve different teams. And of course, like with anything else in medicine, good communication is a foundation communication with your patients about their fears, communication with their family and whanau, and of course, communication between the different providers. And for the patient, it is really focus on their goals. And that is something that really works in the clinic setting. If you open the clinic, question with an open, or the clinic with an open question and focus on their goals and what they want to achieve, you already have the way in. And uh, you have concrete and achievable plans, really with little reminders, little things that help like um, blister packing for medication, all the little things that we do in a clinical practice make a, make a big difference. And of course, tailored education, one size doesn't fit all. And education that is really focused on skills. So workshops, skills workshop. I will show you something about shared medical appointments that we just recently started. And looking into other services that work around. So that's now work from a group which was established really three years ago. I see one of our members sitting in the room here. Um, from the Diabetes Service Level Alliance, which is in collaboration between Auckland DHB and Vitamata DHB and the primary health care organizations in uh, the northern two DHBs in Auckland. And we started with a co-design project. And so that were really the aims. And I wanted to highlight a couple of them. There's lots of things on the slides there. But patient-centered and the relationship based. So really looking what patients actually want and then work to improve standards because one other issue is service delivery in diabetes is quite varied between different primary care providers. So when diabetes moved out from secondary care into primary care, some practices took it on really well and other people still struggle. So to have a unified model of diabetes care provision in primary care is something which is very important. And that's why I also highlighted consistency there. So that were really some of the highlights what people brought back. And they were interesting enough, again, culture specific. So for Maori, it was feeling ashamed, stigma, lack of acceptance and respect. For Pacifica, it was mostly motivation and family support, often churches as well. Mental and spiritual well-being became very important. And then, of course, lack of knowledge and competencies and access to services, little things like car parking, transport, having time off, coordinating appointments, all these things. And for care teams, it was access often to mental health, limitations due to technology, and competing priorities on time and resources and overburdened services, as we all know. And so the outcome was put into these eight categories. So what's if, what really the finding were? It's important to have a confident and a competent primary care team, to have integrated mental health, behavioral and social support, 
uh, practice cultural safety and have easy access to care, whether that is closer to the patient's home, whether it's free car parking, all these other things. Uh, seamless continuing care, really having easy access to specialists, not having to wait a long time to see a specialist or see three different specialists. Uh, then learning to live well with diabetes, all the practical aspects around living with diabetes. Behavior change and of course, determined by the person as we already said before. So a second project really which came out there was a mentorship model. So as I mentioned, the provision of primary care can be different if you go to different practices. To upscale the knowledge of the practices, what really worked, and that's also from my previous experience, is I dedicated nurse in the GP practice. A nurse that is interested in chronic care management uh, is well equipped, has a time, resource, and knowledge. That actually makes all the difference whether chronic disease is well managed in the primary care setting. So therefore, what we have uh, actually a well-supported liaison with secondary nurses, secondary care nurses, and primary care nurses in this mentoring model. So, and that's what you can see there. So it was basically coaching and mentoring. Uh, we had four practices last year, and this year we're planning up to 12 practices. So that is quite a time commitment for the different practices as well as for secondary care services. But I believe that is really where the core of secondary care services education part really lies as well. So what did we do? So we basically uh, not only set up the relationships, but we also looked into funding, the DICP funding. We made it more flexible and came away from just simply monitoring to allow practices to actually use it more flexibly. And what really worked well, as you can see there on your left side, is practices that had extended consulting time, who had a nurse, um, and who had some dedicated insulin initiation sessions. And yes, it's a long way. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, relationship building is really important as well. And that leads me to the conclusion from this early stages, what we found from the, core from the mentoring project is really that it is important to have a well-organized primary care practice with a dedicated focus on chronic disease management. We had different experiences in our first few practices. And if there's a right structure and setup and the right mindset, then it works. And it not only enhances patient satisfaction and efficiency and the revenues of the praxis, but it actually makes sense for the praxis and it actually enjoys or makes it enjoyable for the people who are involved with it because they can focus on chronic disease management rather than rush, being rushed between different commitments. And it allows planned care rather than delayed and opportunistic intervention. So that's some data I want to show you. I don't know whether you can read it yet. Uh, from one of the other areas we worked on, um, podiatry. So part of the Diabetes Service Level Alliance work was looking into what happened in podiatry. And you can see health inequity again here. So that's uh, slides from Michelle Garrett, who is the uh, community lead for podiatry in Auckland. And you can see that for Maori and Pacific, the uh, average rate for amputation that is major and minor amputation is significantly higher than for other ethnicities. And that it is basically related to your deprivation and it is related to gender. So therefore, if you are Maori or Pacific male living in a deprived area, you will have the highest rate of amputation. And if you know this one, you can actually focus there. When it starts with uh, footwear, care, looking after your feet, all these little things because you know where to home in. And what we basically did, we looked into 
a mentoring for uh, community podiatrists, improving service standards, having all the podiatrists up to similar standards, doing uh, foot screening, earlier referral, and uh, better pathways, and earlier intervention before people come for an amputation. The other area where we worked in is retinal screening. As you probably aware, there are guidelines from the ministry and targets of um, coverage of retinal screening and how to do it. We in Auckland for many years, which I inherited from Dr. Paul Drury, uh, a very well running um, retinal screening service. However, retinal screening wasn't really coordinated through Auckland. And there are different models that were tested and then been revoked afterwards. And our screening rate, which we found recently out, was actually much lower than we thought we had it. So we saw there are two ways you can do it. You either go around and approach different practices, or you do a data match, what we did. So very sort of easy, but actually quite time costly data match. So we matched our a retinal screening database we had in the diabetes center where all the referrals for Auckland and Waitamata come uh, with the patient enrolled in practices based on their diabetes read code and their NHIs. And so we had a two-step process. The first step we identified our coverage rate and the second was we identified the individual patients and now we're in a process of encouraged referral, prioritization and monitoring. And even that is not easy because even if you know that there are these unscreened patients, it needs a little while before they actually referred for screening. Parallel to this, what we did um, with the ophthalmologist, we developed, what, the ophthalmologist developed, we have to be very precise there, developed a artificial intelligent program where uh, you can actually use artificial intelligence to read your images. So, and in addition to this one, we used our databases also to develop a predict model where you can individualize your uh, screening intervals because we know that we often screen the wrong people in the wrong frequency. So if you have good control, you're a European and you have no retinopathy, your chance of developing eye disease is very low and you could be screened every five years. However, if you marry Pacifica and you have poor control and you already have established disease, you may need screening every six, three or six months at least. So therefore, having a tool that actually tells you individualized what is your screening interval is great help. And it also can save resources and there's a lot of data from Europe and the UK. So and we did, uh, again, for the retinal screening, a little work around co-design. So actually asking our patients what they wanted and how we actually can improve screening. Another area which is very important is data sharing. I showed you at the beginning um, that we were only able to actually track process or lack thereof by having access to data. And that's very important to actually have access to the data and be mindful, of course, of all the technical, legal, cultural, and practical challenges that come along with it. So and when we do our five indicators, we have uh, quite a number of resources we track the data from. And that's what you can see, so I just covered it up. That's when we started off in uh, 2018. So you can see um, by different PHOs uh, what is their H1C outcome, how many patients have no H1C. And so that's a great tool to actually improve because you can actually have it broken down by the different um, PHOs and practices, and then you can either focus on these or you focus on this. So you have learning from the well-performing, but you can support the people who actually struggle. Now, I want to give you a couple of examples from the Diabetes Center. So we did rapid access clinics, nothing new, but why did we do it? Because our uh, new to follow-up ratio was really skewed to patients coming for years. And it was really due to the fact that 
there were very stringent discharge criteria and a limited trust in the providers. Patients often came back uh, after not having achieved targets. And we had, of course, a number of cohorts that are belonging to secondary care, like type 1, uh, cancer, uh, other rare forms of diabetes. So, and I know other DHBs, they got rid of their type 2 diabetic patients nearly altogether. We said we keep our type 2 diabetic patients, but we approach them differently. So what we did basically, we had this rapid access, or we have this rapid access clinic. We established them really a year and a half ago, and we had the moment of auditing our data and uh, mapping the patient's journey from the beginning and making sure the patients and the provider know from the beginning that's only a short episode. The other thing what we did, we employed a, co a care coordinator. Um, you've probably all seen care coordinators in primary care, but there aren't many care coordinators in secondary care. So we had one person uh, who had a very kind of an open job description, which I drew up based on different ideas of social workers and uh, youth health workers. And she grew very well in the role, and as you can see from the little graph on the bottom from her, so it reduced the DNA rate significantly, but it also uh, improved other markers, like dispensing on HbA1c. She is not a clinician. She doesn't uh, give any medication, doesn't intensify medication. She asked us sometimes for a script, but simply by improving adherence to medication you achieve the significant improvement in the HP1C, especially the people with a very high HP1C. All right. So, and the other thing what we're doing, we're combining more clinics. For example, our registrars work with our podiatrists. So they see the patients when the patients come for podiatry. That allows uh, far less DNA. Our podiatrists now working in renal units so when patients sit on their dialysis, they get their podiatry done at the same time. And the last thing from our examples is really uh, about shared medical appointments. We tried it, we started it off end of last year, so we have our second cohort running at the moment. It's still new for me and for the team involved. And we focused on obesity management, but you can do it for lots of other things. You can do it for groups that are ethnically matched, you can do it for insulin stats, you can do it for other things. And um, really, the idea is, and I'm mindful of time, that it is not group education. It is basically a group where you have a clinician in a room plus a second um, provider plus a coordinator. And you go through and you actually take a history after patients consented for giving the history in an open forum. And with this, you actually create a completely different bonding. You improve the adherence rate, the attendance rate. And uh, from our first group, really, we realized it's important to have a physician and it would run very well in primary care as well, a GP part of the sessions, uh, and to have the whole care team involved and to actually allow a lot of bonding and learning, not only during the session, but also between the sessions. And for the healthcare providers in the room, it is actually enjoyable. It's a little stretch exercise because you actually have to concentrate far more than you have in the individual session, and you're watched, so you actually um, have to really live up to your skills. So it's a, it's a great experience for everyone. So last couple of slides. So to sum it up, I mentioned a lot about system level measures and I'm very, very reassured by what we heard from the minister before that there are a lot of initiatives going on and we on the ground really can't do this by ourselves. So actually having a value-based health system where we're looking on outcomes rather than what we're putting in having enhanced primary care, as I showed you before, where really is a focus on chronic disease management with a dedicated nurse and a close link between primary and secondary care. And working with multiple agencies. We recently realized this one when we talked about new diabetes drugs working together with our renal and nephrology colleagues that worked very well. 
and using other providers, community providers, NGOs, great experience, Mana 2 in um, total health care, not in um, National Horror Coalition, uh, PHO, they had great experience with a prog program combining social and medical care. And for the providers, what I really said, the nurse-led model, the links, the cultural competence, and the funding envelope that allows it. And for our patients, really, start with a co-design, whatever service you want to develop. Have dedicated teams who really enjoy what they're doing. Allow access, make it easy to have access. Think about the little things. Start with the whole family when you plan your services. Look for modern technology, as I showed you with retinal screening, because it can save revenue and cost. And be open to creative solutions. So yes, closing off is our case. So what would have happened to her if we had an ideal situation? She may never had developed diabetes after her first presentation with gestational diabetes, because she may have lost weight. And if she developed, she probably would have access early on to a dedicated team, would have taken her whole family and her own life situation into account. And she may have had psychological support and input early on for her trauma, which would have made it much easier to deal with her weight. And she would have maybe access to medication that would have helped her along earlier on. She would have had reminders, little things that actually helps her daily. And that would be supported by a primary care setting where the service is structured and supported and funded for it. And for the funders in the room, that really would make sense if we look about a long-term approach, because chronic disease is a long-term approach. Thank you. So we have a few questions here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Joy. Um, so that, that co-design working group, um, along with the um, members of the Diabetes Service Level Alliance, who are the, the governing body for that um, co-design working group, um, we're working through an equity-focused uh, framework to bring the challenge continually to that programme of work and to, to, to provide guidance for it. And just as you were speaking about the clinical inertia aspect there in the, um, in the clinical setting, um, so that what was resonating in my head was, you know, the, what portion of that is around unconscious bias and uh, essentially racism, not to, you know, put too fine a point on it. Um, and just how we are going to mobilise to address that. Yeah. Okay, I guess to be clear, what I said before, first it is about cultural awareness and cultural competence. And I think there's a difference between cultural competence and cultural awareness. And cultural competence is really about your own reflection on how you approach individual people. So I think we in New Zealand are actually quite in a good position that this is a part of our healthcare system, that we all have to do it as part of our requirements for our colleges to be culturally competent and culturally aware of things. The second aspect is what works really well is you have people in your team 
that actually come from the different cultures. Because if you have a um, Pacifica nurse or a dietitian speaks to a Pacifica person, they can do a much better job than I will ever be able to do. So that's what I said to you at the beginning. So I try that our team reflects the people sitting in our waiting area. And that allows us to have the approach to the different cultures and to their individual needs. Thank you for your presentation, very good. You mentioned about um, two to 14 year old, that 12.3% obesity, mm -hmm. which of course is something the ministry is focused on at the moment. Is there, you talked about um, seeing younger people in the diabetes centre, is there a different approach or can you just talk a little bit to that because um, I myself am a dietitian and I know the difference between working with young people versus adults and I just wondered if you could share a little bit more on what's been working well for you. Thank you for the question. Now, first I have to say we are an adult service, so we start with 16 years old, so I don't see any children. Um, obesity management in New Zealand is still in infancy steps, <laughs> to paraphrase you there. So we don't have much available. So we have a bariatric service, and a lot of patients are declined from bariatric services, and you have to be 18 or older to qualify for bariatric surgery at the moment. So we see more and more young obese patients, and I'm open for people who also have pre-diabetes or are recently diagnosed because that actually works best, especially for the rapid access. So I say I can't give you an answer what we able to do at the moment, but my hope and my real belief is that we should do more and that we should really have structures around that type 2 diabetes and obesity needs to work together, that there should be a seamless transition from pediatrics to adults, the same as we do for type 1. We should do for type 2 as well, and there's no service for the type 2, even as we know that they actually have worse outcomes. Uh, so yes, um, there's lots of still things still to be done. So far we had had a mixed group. So we, as I said to you, we're having our second group at the moment. Our first group was quite heavy with Pacifica, but that was just by the people coming through, uh, which made it easier because there was bonding. We were discussing at the beginning whether we made them ethnically specific or uh, all comers, and we found it was good to have all comers uh, because it opens up the group, but it was for adults, because we are in adult services. And, but the idea is about you have to have a similar outcome approach. You can't have shared medical appointments with people having different intentions why they come. So you have to have one outcome, whether it's insulin initiation, whether it's weight management. We use weight management with meal replacement at the beginning and then transition over. So you have to have a shared goal where they all work to. That's the core function there. Mm -hmm. Melanie Taylor, and I'm interested in the amount of review you have to follow up people, because we know even the most um, activated patients, when life stresses get in the way, their self-management skills then often drop. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your wraparound package look like for the, for the clients in this group? Okay, so means we are a secondary care service, so we stratify our patients. So we have different services for people with type 2 versus those with type 1. So we have a clinical psychologist, which is a core component of our service. We have a number of dietitians. We have the podiatrists. We have specialist nurses with prescribing rights. 
uh, and we have our care coordinator and then retinal screening in-house. So we have a full set of secondary care services, which is geared to the high end of needs, really. We're also working with other services in-house together. They are localized in the same place. For patients with intermediate needs, like a lot of type 2s, we rely heavily on primary care because that's where I believe they should be seen. And our job really is to get patients in with a particular question, focus on this question, give guidance to the primary care team, whether it's insulin starts and practices that don't do insulin starts, whether it is a commencement of new medications, whether that is focusing other problems that need to be solved, whether it's a differential diagnosis where they're not so clear what kind of diabetes it is. So that's the kind of other group we get, but then we have the whole wraparound service for the core group of ours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a really strong start to the conference and some re already key themes emerging. Um, I won't spend time summarizing them now because I want you to go and enjoy networking and go to the morning tea.